Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and uh, to everyone joining us today. I don't know exactly where you are, except I am delighted you could be with us today for this very special event, a preview of our Animation Arts Signature Auction that takes place June 19th through June 21st at our world headquarters in Dallas, and of course, online. This is only our second live virtual auction preview, which lets Heritage Auctions into your house, since for the moment you cannot come to our new one. And for the foreseeable future, we will be inviting our experts uh, here to preview upcoming auctions to discuss some notable lots, to field some questions from our audience, uh, and to get uh, to know our experts. My name is Robert Wolanski. I'm Heritage Auctions' relatively new communications director. And for the next half hour or so, I'll be fielding those questions from you, those of you in attendance, through the uh, Q&A feature. So anonymously, ask me questions that I will then ask Jim who's delighted to answer them during this preview or uh, afterwards, uh, or uh, you can stick around and we can, we can talk as long as you want. I'm really thrilled to invite uh, Jim Lentz here today. Jim is Heritage Auctions Director of Animation Art, and he is a man who will very proudly tell you that he is paid to watch cartoons for a living. Now, this is one of my favorite auctions that we do. It's kind of one of the reasons I came to Heritage for things like this. The fact that we are going to, in a few minutes, discuss Charlie Brown Christmas in the middle of June is something that gives me no small amount of delight. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am very, very proud now to introduce to you Jim Lentz. We could talk for 5 to 10 to 15 to 20 hours, Jim, about this auction. It's kind of an amazing selection of pieces here. Well, I love talking about cartoons. Um, I always tell people my grandparents always wanted a Renoir, my parents always wanted a Rockwell, I always wanted a Mickey Mouse and a Bugs Bunny, you know. Um, I tell people I grew up with Hanna-Barbera, I laughed at Warner Brothers, and I loved Walt Disney. So, you know, you want to talk to me about cartoons, you're, you're making my Friday starting off pretty cool. I have to say, uh, since I've been prepping for this, uh, this discussion, I, I just kind of got lost down the rabbit hole of all the extraordinary things that are available here. I mean, this really is kind of one of the, the most joyful experiences you can have going through these pieces that you've uh, curated for this auction. Well, I tell so, everybody it's an auction of smiles. So let's uh, let's get started. Uh, you've chosen about six to seven lots that we're kind of going to discuss, but there's hundreds in this particular auction. And in fact, uh, here, let me call up the auction page and uh, so show folks, because the fact is there are actually, what, 1,679 pieces in this particular auction, correct? That's the number correct. we see right here. There's something for everybody. <laughs> and if you're uh, new to Heritage, uh, this video that Jim made will uh, be a great preview uh, through the auction. I'm not going to walk it through you net walk you through it now, but if you go to ha.com, you'll be able to see all of that. You'll be able to virtually browse the catalog. Uh, you'll be able to see the sessions that take place beginning on Friday, the 19th at 11 a.m. Central Time. And you'll be able to see all the featured items, the most popular and the most active. I guess I should not be surprised that the Simpsons are amongst the most active. I was surprised to see that the uh, Scooby-Doo there is one of the most active, but that is from the 1969 Hanna-Barbera, correct? Yes, the first season. Scooby-Doo, where are you? There are just no shortage of pieces to discuss. But I know the first one you wanted to talk about is something that I'm incredibly excited to discuss. It is this letter handwritten in a, or, hand, or signed by Walt Disney to the shareholders of, uh, of Walt Disney. So talk a little bit about this, and I'll, I'll scroll folks through it while we're talking about it. Well, I'm very excited because it, we always try to have a new section in every auction that we do. And in this one, we have a section called Signed by Walt Disney, and it has over 25 items that are hand signed by Walt Disney. And that's of significance because many studio artists provided his signature, Hank Porter, Floyd Gottfredson, Bob Moore. And he was at one time, Walt Disney was probably the most recognizable man in the world. So he wasn't doing a lot of the signatures that you see in the marketplace. And we have, as I said, over 25 pieces hand signed by Walt Disney himself. Of those 25, this is my favorite. This comes from the Homer Brightman, a former employee's estate. It is a open letter that talks about the state of the studio circa 1941 on Fantasia Studio 
um, stationary. He talks about the war. He talks about the strike. He talks about financial difficulties. He talks about what's coming out. It is one of the most impressive letters on the state of the studio at this time. And again, hand signed by at the time, probably one of the most recognizable people in the world, Walt Disney. What are some of the other uh, signed pieces by him that in this auction that you're incredibly thrilled about? But I, I want to come back to this one because this is a really detailed and a very difficult sort of letter, it looks like, for him to write. Well, you know, in the last sale, we had a letter where he came out, somebody asked him if they would ever do live action films. And he said no in that letter. And it got tremendous response in our last auction because, you know, there'd be no Mary Poppins, there'd be no Flubber, there would be no live action films according to this 1940 letter. So these letters really tell you where, what his state of mind was for his studio at that time. And this might be the most detailed letter that I think we've ever come across in the marketplace. This signed by Walt Disney section has signed photos, it has signed checks, it has his Director's Guild insurance card from 1955. It has a letter where he's soliciting donations for the 1960 Olympics. Books, um, things that were signed for Joe Rinaldi, uh, things that were signed for longtime animator Don Lusk, um, Diane Disney's book about her father, uh, Walt Disney. It, uh, photos, art, work. Um, it's a pretty extraordinary and all-encompassing section. What, what is this? I guess my question would be, so you have this Fantasia letterhead here. How significant or how much more special does it make this particular letter than if it had just been written on some white piece of paper? Well, you know, every time that the studio had a new feature film coming out, there was letterhead that would go with it because that was a self-promotion. If Peter Pan was out, letters were going out with a Peter Pan letterhead. If Mary Poppins was going out, and we've sold in the past a collection of all the letterhead, it kind of tells you that this definitely is 1940, 1941 because of the Fantasia uh, letterhead. It really helps um, clarify the time frame and thought pattern behind the letter. Jim, somebody asks uh, via the Q&A, can you let us know who authenticated the Walt Disney signatures? We do a lot of work with Phil Sears. So somebody else asks as well, when Fantasia was released, did Walt Disney or the studio have any inclination at the time that it would become the timeless classic that it has today? Well, it was thought at the time to be Walt Disney's favorite film and his personal film that he really wanted to make a statement about the importance of music and really to push the envelope on what animation could rely. Um, they had a special Fanta sound system that was designed that had to go from theater to theater for premieres in major cities. And because of that, initially, it lost money. Um, and the losing money and then World War II and the strike, there was supposed to be an immediate sequel, Fantasia II, that got shelved until Roy Disney in um, 2000 came out with uh, Fantasia Continues. Right. Well, let's go on to another piece. Uh, we have a lot of things to get to, and I don't want to, uh, like I said, you and I could talk for about 10 hours, and I look forward to the, uh, the day we get a chance to do that. But this is something else that you have brought up, and this is just an extraordinary piece. This is something that I had never seen before. Uh, we've all seen Peter Pan. We all think we know Peter Pan. But an auction like this shows us that we only begin to know the surface of the surface until we dive into something like this. Well, after the success of Snow White and the move to the new studio, there were many, many projects underway. Uh, Bambi was underway for years and Pinocchio and Fantasia. But Walt had purchased the rights to Peter Pan as well as Alice in Wonderland. And prior to World War II, extensive story and concept art was done. And the leading artist for the initial project with Peter Pan was David Hall. And his artwork is so sought after uh, for both Peter Pan and Alice in, in Wonderland. And this might be the finest piece that Heritage Auctions has brought to market. Um, it was actually used 
for the cover of They Drew As They Pleased, The Hidden Art of Disney's Musical Years by the great Didier Getz. Um, and it comes from the Joe Rinaldi archive. Joe Rinaldi was a longtime storyboard artist that worked from the early 1940s all the way up through the 1970s, um, had a great, great hand in the development of Lady and the Tramp. And as I went through his archives, you could see how he kept pieces for influence. And he had a handful of David Hall pieces that must have spoke to him. And as I was just going through the archive of his son, this popped out and I knew immediately that this was gonna be the cover piece for our auction. Um, every one of our auctions, we try to have a, a film that we pick out as a, a main theme. And this one is Peter Pan. We have over 50 original Peter Pan pieces in this auction, which is quite a lot. And this, this has to be one of the top three Peter Pan pieces and top three pieces in the entire auction. So, so there's several questions about this, but somebody asked with a lot like this, how much of the popularity and value of Peter Pan art is because it was such an amazing film that has survived the test of time? We certainly all know much of Peter Pan by heart. And how much of it is because of the scarcity of such art like this? Well, I always tell people, you buy art because you like it. And that's it, bottom line, you buy what you like. When I'm pressed and someone says, what determines the value? I have my own self-written five things that determine the value of a piece of animation art. One is popularity of character. And we all know the popularity of Peter Pan. The second thing is the pose. You know, I always tell people, you know, the pose is everything. Lady and the Tramp having spaghetti is far more popular um, a pose than say Lady when she has her muzzle on. And this is Peter Pan, Wendy, Nana, you know, on the Jolly Roger in all their glory. So it's popularity posed scarcity. David Hall's 1939, 1940 has a high scarcity factor and that's gonna to contribute to the value. Condition of the art. Condition what is the size of this piece, Jim? Oh, I'd have to look that up. Let's see, I think it's in our description. It is lot number 98374. It's 13 and a quarter by 10 inches. Excellent. Um, it's popularity, it's pose, it's scarcity, and it's condition. And the condition of this is the colors pop. It hasn't been in any sunlight, it's been in a folder, and it is just brilliant considering that it's over 70 years old. The last thing I look at when I look at value is what I call variables. Is it signed? Yes, it is. Does it have a province? Yes, it does. Has it been restored? No, it hasn't. So those are my five things, popularity, pose, scarcity, condition, and a handful of variables. That sounds like an excellent thing. I should, be, I should have written that down. I feel like uh, we'll, we'll have to revisit that later. Yes, so keeping will. with Peter Pan, let's, uh, let's go to this particular piece. This is certainly the Peter Pan we all know. Well, you know, this is a great piece. This is a hand-inked production cell of Peter Pan flying Captain Hook with his hook, with his sword, and his uh, accomplished Mr. Schmeen. And all three cells are trimmed and mounted to a master pan, hand-painted production background of the deck of the Jolly Roger. It's one of the single best setups I've seen come from this film where you have all three characters on the hand-painted background. It's a master background meeting. This background was used in the film as were these cells. And um, it's, it's just a, a really fun piece that really encompasses good versus evil, happy versus, you know, sad. Look at the facial expression of Peter Pan. Look at the facial expression of Hook and even Mr. Schmee. It's just, it has Peter Pan written all over it. It certainly brings everybody alive. And, and that's sort of the interesting thing I've always found about these cells, especially the way this setup is. It, it almost renders it three-dimensional when you look at it as a, as a piece of art as opposed to the film itself. Oh, I just, you know, it just takes you right back there. I can hear Captain Hook going, Mr. Schmee! I love it. So I want to go back to, to, to some other art that we're less familiar with uh, in these particular auctions because that's sort of the thing that has amazed me when I've looked through all of this is that we see a thing like the Peter Pan from the film itself, a production cell. 
Then we see the concept paintings. And the concept paintings are the things that got us to the things that made the moment in these films, like in these characters, so iconic. And Mary Blair certainly was the greatest at doing that. So let's talk about this piece because I've just been in love with it ever since the first time I saw it. Well, you know, I always say, you know, uh, the great John Canemaker has written about three books on Mary Blair and he always writes the art and flair of Mary Blair. She was art director and color stylist um, and said to be one of Walt Disney's favorite artists. And she sets the tone for the films that she goes to work on and it's really her explosion of color. Um, I love this piece. It's a large piece for a Mary Blair. And again, it comes from the great Joe Rinaldi, long time, 30 plus year storyboard artist at Disney. And it was one that just fell out of a folder. And it's the kind of piece where you can see he's keeping pieces from fellow artists that he likes and or inspires him. Um, Mary Blair's work on these films, she, she would just do hundreds upon hundreds of films exploring color. You look at those little birds with yellow and blue in the background, I mean yellow and red in the background off a, off a sunset, and then you get back to her coming through, um, you know, a portion of the Tugley Woods with the daffodils, and it's a piece that's never been seen before. Um, it's probably one of the most extraordinary Mary Blairs from this film we've ever seen. There are so many books written about her. She is in the Didier Getz books, They Drew As They Pleased, three John Kane Maker books, Mindy Johnson's The Women of Ink and Paint, a brand new book called The Queens, I'm at the Queens of Animation. Um, her artwork is probably being is probably the most desired of Disney artists currently in the marketplace. And um, this one with a province from uh, Joe Rinaldi is just too good to be true. So what does it mean? I mean, so when you bring a piece like this that has never before been seen, what does that do to our reevaluation of Mary Blair, the value of her work, the importance of her work? Um, one of the reasons I love working here, one of the reasons I came here three months ago was because I always said that I liked being at a place that felt like a museum where you could touch things. And history seemed to be evolving every day when you work at Heritage in as much as that our perception of Alice in Wonderland changes dramatically when we see a piece like this. So what was it like for you the first time you saw this particular piece? Well, I'll back into that a little bit. When I first started at Heritage, somebody said to me, what's it like working at Heritage? And I said, it's like Willy Wonka goes to the Smithsonian. Um, you just every day, the more you walk around, you know, the more you see. Um, the thing with this Mary Blair artwork is new to market is probably the most exciting thing in my position when I'm trying to tell somewhat of a history of animation through 1600 lots in every major studio. And I find a, what I consider a trophy piece, an important piece, and it has a great province and it's never been seen before. So your savvy collector who's been doing this as long as I've been doing this, all of a sudden says, is going through this auction catalog. And that's where I think we really shine. We try to bring 60 to 70% of the lots in our animation auctions of pieces you've never seen before. We have represented the states of Les Clark, Elmer Plummer, Retta Scott, the Mary Blair Family Trust, Bob Balzer, um, Chuck Jones. And when you represent an estate, things that have never been seen before in the collecting market seem to fall into our lap and that's what separates us and why we are the market leader in animation art on who we represent. So when I see this piece and I know how important Mary Blair's work is and to have such a significant piece from a significant province never seen before kind of makes my day. I go home with a smile that day. Well it's interesting I just got through running about a, a Rockwell. To me pieces like this are you know they're on that, that, that par. They're just not as represented as well. They're not as understood as well because we sort of think of them as animation art or, or conceptual renderings of a piece that eventually leads to another thing that is better known. A piece like this is as beautiful as anything I've seen uh, during my, my time at, uh, at Heritage. So, so well, you know, I you tell for... people, the thing about animation art is from the beginning of the 1920s all the way up to today, 
people tend to forget that some of the greatest artists we've produced as a nation worked in animation to make a living. And you, you hear names like Mary Blair and Claude Coates and Ivan Earl and Chuck Jones. I mean, these were great artists, you know, Tyrus Wong, you know, the list goes on and on and on. But there are some just brilliant artists and to pay their mortgage and raise a family worked in animation art as their medium. And um, so there are just some stunning pieces of artwork in its own right. And concept art and backgrounds are, so, are just brilliant part of the animation process, as is layout drawings and animation drawings. You know, as Frank and Ali always said, it's the illusion of life. We really believe these characters exist. Somebody asked the question and answer. Uh, I have read many times what you just said, that Mary Blair was Walt Disney's favorite artist. Did he ever actually say that, or is that just others' perception of their relationship and Walt Disney's admiration for Mary Blair? Um, I think that comment is well documented in the one of the John Kane Maker books. Uh, it was either Mark Davis or one of the other WED animators who referred to that when Walt decided he needed to get Mary Blair uh, behind the It's a Small World project. And I think that's where that quote came up when they said, let's get Mary to do it. And I think Mark Davis, or it was another WED animator, was pretty famous for talking about Walt's love for her. I recently read that he didn't have a lot of artists from the studio's art up in his home, and he had a Mary Blair original hanging in his home. We're about to go to a piece that we could spend the next week talking about, in as much as that I spent the last 15 years of my career writing about every two or three years at great length about any part of the Charlie Brown Christmas special that I could discuss. Uh, whether it was the music, the animation, the story behind the special, how it almost didn't happen, and so on and so forth. But the fact is, here we have an extraordinary piece, nine characters, including Snoopy, uh, from the Charlie Brown Christmas special. So let's talk about this, and um, we'll even watch a little bit of the Charlie Brown Christmas special, because it's June 12th, and why wouldn't we? Well, you know... The Charlie Brown and the Peanuts characters came to life in the early 1950s and were not animated until the Tennessee Ernie Ford show for the opening bumpers for the new Ford Falcon. And that was the original animation. And in talking to the late great Bob Balzer, who directed a lot of the Charlie Brown and Snoopy shows, he said animating these flat comic strip characters was not easy. So right out of the box, they come out with a Charlie Brown Christmas which everybody on this viewing, and you and I included, watch every single holiday season. It is a piece of American pop culture. It is Americana. It has the Linus moment, which is the first biblical reference we've seen in a cartoon, which is the most heartfelt moment in the cartoon. And the other thing of interest is nobody was really collecting animation art in 1965. There was no animation art program at the Bill Melendez Studios. Most of these that we see come to market were given to representatives from Coca-Cola, people who worked on the film. Um, they come from, you know, very good provinces, um, advertising agency people. Um, there's not a lot of this in the marketplace. The studio kept a handful um, for historical purposes but there is very little original artwork from this film. This is only, I've seen two pieces with Charlie Brown and um, Linus and Snoopy at the tail end of this, but this opening whip with, yeah, I might add Pigpen in his dust at the end. <laughs> this is the first uh, cell from this scene I've seen from this iconic Emmy Award winning, Peabody Award winning, piece of animation and television history. It's extraordinary too, given the fact that this was a, considered a bomb. They didn't want to, they didn't want to initially air this uh, when it was finished. Uh, there, there's such a, a rich story behind it, uh, but I can't help, but every time I look at this particular scene, I, I hear the skating music, I hear Christmas time is here. Um, so, so let's take just a moment and actually sort of see the scene from the special in which this particular moment can be found. The great Vince Guaraldi score. 
turn it into a problem. Maybe Lucy's right. Along the Charlie Brown to the world, you're the Charlie Browniest. There it is. So heartfelt, so simple, yet so perfect. Think of any of mind if we just sit here and watch this for the rest of the day? It's like I said, do I get paid to sit around and watch cartoons all day? Yes, I do. You absolutely do, and I'm incredibly jealous. I have to say, uh, several years ago uh, in my other life, I wrote about uh, a, a couple of Charlie Brown Christmas pieces that, that Heritage has auctioned. They've only been a handful of them over the years, and they all tend to go for a significant amount of money, certainly because of the fact that you can actually own that moment from that thing that you and your family have loved for generations. It's, it's kind of an extraordinary thing. That's exactly right. All right. So uh, speaking of a thing that we all... Uh, I love that you picked this. This was a following Charlie Brown Christmas with a I Dream of Jeannie still was a production cell was just, uh, I thought, kind of brilliant because I remember watching this. Uh, obviously, we all did. Let's talk about this opening. This is from the animated opening, obviously, from uh, I Dream of Jeannie. Well, you know, when I was in college, the question always was in terms of Gilligan's Island, Marianne or Ginger, and you would make your pick. Let's say Marianne <laughs> would win. And then you would say Marianne or Jeannie. And Jeannie always won. 1960s television opening animation from I Dream of Jeannie and Bewitched is so remembered by so many generations. I have a 24-year-old daughter that has the complete Bewitched and the complete Jeannie series on DVD when she was in high school. And when I sent her the catalog, the email I got from my daughter Taryn was, you have an I Dream of Jeannie cell? in your sale and she thought it was mine because I own one of these. I think it's one of the most iconic television moments. Um, Hanna-Barbera did the animation for Bewitched and I believe to Patty Freeling, Chris Freeling's company, did the opening animation for I Dream a Genie. Um, some of these were sold for a CIFA Hollywood fundraising in the 1970s. These uh, cell sales were organized by June Ferre in the parking lots of supermarkets in California for the local animation union, ASIFA. And that's where many of these originally surfaced. Um, I don't have a lot of animation up on my walls in my home, but I have a genie up in my wall because it's one of the most uh, remembered uh, watching with the family shows ever. And as I said earlier, Marianne or genie, genie. You know, somebody asked in the Q&A, the last episode of I Dream of Jeannie was 50 years ago, just last month, which is kind of extraordinary. Oh, that's a good one. That's pixie dust. And I have to say, it went off the air, somebody asked, when it went off the air 50 years ago, was it mourned like Master Cheers or has its popularity and the popularity of art like this over the last half century uh, grown as viewers reflect on a great show from, from the good old days, from yesteryear? I think when they got married, it jumped the shark a little bit. <laughs> uh, but that's is it, it, it is it as beloved today as but it was I, has lived it on in rerun i think it's lived on in runs tv land dvd releases um and i recently saw a picture within the last year or so of barbara eden today she looks fantastic She's immortalized certainly here. So I want to go to this, uh, this item you picked because uh, I'm fascinated by the fact that of all the pieces we've talked about so far, this is the one that has the highest current bid. And I need you to explain to me what this is and why this is already a week out, such a significant and popular piece. Well, we've seen at Heritage Auctions a new department where we sell vintage video games that are sealed, graded, and the prices have been off the market. We forget that the video game um, demographic is now making money and our collectors, video game collectors are a huge market. 
there is very little artwork to video games that is known to exist today. This Don Bluth produced first Laserdisc video game, Dragon's Lair, um, is a massive size piece, like 36 inches tall, um, and it's a brilliant piece of artwork. The value is three things. A, because of the history of the video game and its connection with Don Bluth. B, the artwork was done by one of the great background and development artists in animation, the late, great Ron Diaz, who I knew personally. Ron started, won a art contest in Hawaii, was hired by the Walt Disney Company as a kid, started working on Sleeping Beauty, went on to work for Chuck Jones, Don Bluth, uh, Walt Disney, Hanna-Barbera, was one of the first background artists for Scooby-Doo. This artwork is done by Ron Diaz and is actually signed by him. The third reason I think the, the value on this is up, this game was given a second life through the Netflix series Stranger Things. Dragon's Lair is in the main plot line towards the end of season one and ongoing where the characters are playing Dragon's Lair. And when I went to Comic-Con last year, there were replicas or dummy Dragon's Lair games at the train trestle promoting Stranger Things. So it's a combination of very rare original artwork for video gaming, Don Bluth, the artist who did it, the size of the piece, and Stranger Things. How's that? That's quite a combo platter you've served up there, sir. I, uh, I, I can see why people are, uh, are bidding on it. In fact, uh, you have made me decide to bid on it. Uh, no way at $21,000, I probably won't be. All right, so a couple of questions have popped up and I wanna sort of go back to the, to the beginning here, if you don't mind, because I had some questions about a few other pieces. Somebody asks, what is the piece in this auction that no one is talking about but should be? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, there is a piece in this auction that- You tell me and I'll pull it up here, we'll look at it. I'm gonna i got to find it. Um, 98556. Um, this is a sequence of four animation drawings. And I really love animation drawings. That is the illusion of life. And it's, I've never seen four better Mickey Mouse Sorcerer's Apprentice production drawings from Fantasia in sequence, um, as good as this ever. And I think because we have so many good Fantasia uh, Mickey Mouse pieces in this sale, this one has been getting looked over. And, you know, a good animation drawing of Mickey in this pose is 1,000 to 1,500, and there's four of them. Um, I think they've been folded back because of the matting, and that might turn some people over. But I actually think this is a piece I've not got a lot of questions about, and I really find four in sequence of this quality to be pretty amazing. So you're saying it's not going to stay at $78? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's something that should be getting a pretty good look at. I wanted to talk to you about the, there was the, um, this Simpsons piece. I mean, I mean, look, there's, there's 800 pieces we could talk about, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this particular Simpsons piece, because this thing is fantastic as well. I love these uh, production cells, the couch gag. I mean, the, these don't seem, I don't see these a lot of popping no, they, up all they, over the place. The studio was very, um, they didn't release a lot of couch gags. Uh, the backgrounds were painted on cell. I think this is only maybe the third couch gag that has come into us. Um, they're few and far between. The great thing I'm most excited about with The Simpsons is if you want to scroll to lot, let me look it up here. Um, how about 98156? Oh, the box set, yes. The king of independent animation, Bill Plimpton, is from Oregon, um, as is Matt Groening, the creator, and has been asked to do 
I don't know, a couple couch gags and um, a bunch of projects in his freeform style uh, of The Simpsons. And when they released the box set for season 17, he was asked to do the animation for intros, uh, menu, the actual box design. And this is original production artwork used for the 17th season DVD release by Bill Plimpton hand signed. It's like the greatest television animation um, show in the history of television meets the king of independent animation, Academy Award nominee and you know how to how to smoke, how to save your face, uh, the great Bill Plimpton. And um, there's, there's about 20 lots of his original artwork. And it's the first time we've had his artwork in this sale. And there are some um, pieces from his independent work, even a Kanye West video. And um, I think these are rare treasures in this, in this sale. And yeah, Bill Plimpton, I believe, is a, an Oscar winner. That's true. The All last, right. you have time for one more, or we got to wrap this up? Oh, no, no, we have time. We have about 10 more minutes. I, 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 Why don't you I, look I, at 98454. All right. 98454. Hang on a second here. Has somebody else had a question about something else? 98454? 98, no, 98454, yeah. Um, this is the official Don Ducky Williams painting that he did to celebrate Walt Disney World's 35th birthday. Uh, they published it in a limited edition piece that was sold at the park, but this is his massive one-of-a-kind painting. It's in a frame of 48 inches by 36 inches. Um, Don Ducky Williams worked for Disney for 37 years, was kind of the unofficial artist of Walt Disney World. Um, you see signs in the park, you see artwork in the park. Um, he, his, his, his thumbprint is everywhere. And there's 35 hidden Mickeys in this drawing. Um, and as we like to say, this is the published original. This is the painting um, that they made the limited edition from. And this is the first time we've highlighted Don Ducky Williams. We have a massive collection of all his original paintings done down at the park. And of all of them, this is probably the most significant, but the whole collection in this sale is noteworthy. So I just wanted to, you know, call that out. We actually use this piece as one of our covers. We think it's so important. Somebody has a question about 98723. So let me jump to that real quick. Um, and I'll bring up the question. So somebody asked about this particular piece here. If you want to describe what it is real quick, and then I will uh, we'll ask the question. Oh, it's original Ivan Earl color key concept painting. Uh, he was the color stylist and background painter for Sleeping Beauty and um, worked, I think, over seven years on this film. So the question here is, uh, there's no signature, obviously, on it. How do we know the provenance of a piece like this? Uh, provenance comes from a lot of places. It comes from what it's painted on. It comes from the paint type. It comes from who the consigner is, um, who sometimes likes to remain um, anonymous. It comes from a whole team of experts here that actually goes over every single piece we get in. I mean, we have 1,600 pieces in this sale. And as I like to say, we're cartoonologists. Um, so we look at paint type, we look at what it's painted on, we look at who the consigner is, we look at similar. Um, there's an awful lot that you never hear about that we turn down. Um, those are basically the variables we look at. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the, uh, to the top of the uh, animation art signature auction here. And I'm gonna ask I would you- I also say, just to add to that, yeah. um, we also confer with many experts in the field. If we feel that, um, you know, if we have a question on something, we have kind of a virtual who's who of animation outside of heritage auctions that are acquaintances of mine for my over 30 years in this business that we also um, talk to. Excellent. So somebody has just a general question before I let you go, which is, 
Do you generally recommend restoring cells when the paint chips or cracks, or does that decrease the value of the piece when you try to restore it? Okay, I'm going to give you Jim Lentz's answer. That's why, that's why you're here. Um, you know, they have restored the Sistine Chapel. They have uh, restored uh, the Last Supper. Um, animation art was never meant to be a piece of art. It was supposed to be moved around, flipped, photographed. It was supposed to make a film. If an animation cell is almost too perfect, that's where I, I, I go, something's wrong here. There should always be an anomaly. There should always be something. If it's too perfect, that's why they made limited editions. My opinion on restoration is, um, long as it is properly restored, um, I don't see any problem with restoration as long as it's properly restored. Um, so my personal opinion is if it's done uh, correctly with correct paint formulas and whatnot, I think it enhances the beauty. I think it enhances the life. I don't find anything wrong with it. Um, there are purists that are against that. We don't personally send cells out for restoration. I let the purchaser you know, decide that. Um, so my rule of thumb is if it's professionally done, I think it's fine. Somebody else has popped in here with a question. Oh, somebody, thank you, sir, for that answer. So appreciate that. And look, so I'm going to stop. Uh, we'll, we'll, let's 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 wrap up here. But I will say this: I got lost in this catalog. You could spend all weekend online looking at this thing. The catalog itself is beautiful. The work you've done in putting this together is remarkable. You know, we should tell people if they wanted to order these catalogs, and they are pretty magnificent. Uh, client services is eight six six eight three five three two four three. Uh, still a week away from this sale. We can get you a set of catalogs if you want to order it. Um, and tell people how to get in touch with you if they have questions beyond what we discussed here. Oh, you can email me at jiml at ha.com. Is there a uh, phone number they can get you as well? Uh, probably the best, best right now with the way I'm running around is jiml at ha.com. Well, Jim, this has been a tremendous pleasure for me. Uh, you and I have yet to finally meet in person, but I have to tell you, uh, this has been a, a tremendous thrill. The work you've done, uh, you, you do at Heritage and the work you, you've done over many years has been uh, extraordinary. Putting this together has been nothing but joyful to, to watch and I can't wait to, to see how people respond to it a week from now. It begins on the 19th, runs to the 21st. So thank you very much, Jim. It's my pleasure. You know, considering what we've been going through the last three or four months, um, I think there's never been a better time for an animation art auction. It's an auction of joy and it's an auction of smiles. Really appreciate that. Couldn't have said it better myself, so I won't even try. Jim, I'll see you down the road. Thank you very much.